This video is going to discuss one-sided confidence intervals. Now, ordinarily with a two-sided confidence interval, we identify a window where we think the true parameter lies. So the, we think the true parameter is somewhere between a lower bound and an upper bound. But in some applications, we only care about one end of that bound. So for example, maybe we've just manufactured a, um, a batch of parts and we've told our, um, our customer that there will be no more than one uh, defected out of 10,000. So we don't really care about having a lot that has fewer than that. We just want to make sure the parameter, so the true fraction of defects, doesn't exceed this guaranteed rate. Or alternatively, maybe we uh, have a lot of projects we're doing for some in, in some region, and we want to know the average profit per project. And we really want to know if our average profit will exceed some break-even value. And if it, if it doesn't, then maybe we want to somehow not do those projects. We're not as interested in if the average profit exceeds some you know, upper bound, because we may not do anything differently then. Uh, it's great. We'd, we'd love it if our, if our profit were higher than we thought. But we, you know, our main focus is on not going below some break-even point. Okay, so how do we do that? I'd like to start with a review of two-sided confidence intervals and then show how this you know, translates into the one-sided instance. So let me say that Z sub alpha is the one minus alpha percentile of a normal zero one distribution. So let me just draw a picture. Things are always easier if you draw pictures. Uh, if this is a Z distribution, so what makes it a Z distribution is that the mean is zero, the variance is one. Uh, the number Z alpha is the point where the area in this tail is alpha and the area to the left is one minus alpha. So that's why it's the one minus alpha percentile. All right, so when it comes to a normal two-sided confidence interval, I'm gonna draw a uh, probability distribution for X bar. So X bar will have a normal distribution if the x's are normal, or even if the x's aren't normal, if our sample size is sufficiently large for the central limit theorem to, um, to sufficiently converge, then x bar will still be normal. And what is the mean of x bar? Well, the mean of x bar is just the mean of my x's. So, you know, if, if you really want to write out uh, formally x1 through xn, is a random sample with the expected value of each one of these observations being this mu and the variance of each one of these being sigma squared. All right, so then the, the sampling distribution will be normal with that mean and the variance of x bar is equal to sigma squared over n. Now, I'm going to write down a true statement. So here's the true statement. I'm going to, I'm going to find a point where I stick 1 minus alpha uh, of the area in the middle, and I want alpha by 2 in either, two, either tail. So the sum of these three parts add up to 1, and we still have a probability distribution. Well, Remember that we can convert x bar into a z distribution. So we can make a z if we take x bar minus its mean, divide by its standard deviation. So this is the square root of the variance, which gives the standard deviation. So let me write a true statement. 
So a true statement is that 1 minus alpha is equal to the probability that, well, I'm going to write this whole thing, the z thing that I just um, uh, wrote out, x bar minus mu sigma over the square root of n. So this is definitely between negative z alpha by 2 and positive z alpha by 2. So that is a true statement. You know, that just follows from the fact that x bar is normal. So remember what we do when we, um, we compute a confidence interval? We arrange some terms. So I um, will multiply all three parts of this inequality by the denominator. And then I'm going to move my um, x bar, I'm going to do something really strange. I'm going to move the x bar to the outside and keep the mu in the middle. And so this is equal to the following expression. So after you do your, um, your math, this is x bar minus z alpha by 2 sigma over root n less than mu less than, well, x bar plus z alpha by 2 sigma over root n. All right, so th these are the two ends of my confidence interval. And so if I take the things that I know, you know, x bar, um, uh, uh, that's my, my, my estimator, uh, and go, you know, two standard, standard deviations out from that, um, that gives me a window where I think mu lies with coverage probability 1 minus alpha. Now, by the way, if you don't know sigma, then instead of using a, a z, I'm going to use a t distribution. So t will, would be this. Um, we're going to take x bar minus mu, divide by s over root n. That has a t distribution. We're going to have to use the, the, the quantiles of a... Of a um, T distribution instead of a z distribution. Of course, as n goes to infinity, the t distribution looks more and more like a z distribution, and you get, you know, the same answer as, as n gets very big. All right, so what are we doing with a one-sided confidence interval? Well, with a one-sided confidence interval, let's go draw this um, the sampling distribution again. This is called a sampling distribution. So the mean is still mu, the variance of this distribution is still sigma squared over n. But in this case, I'm going to choose a point where I'm going to stick all of my area in one tail and uh, have all my other area over here. So this would be, you know, like an upper bound, if you will. So what we can do is some very similar uh, math to establish the upper um, so the upper 1 minus alpha percent CI is going to be given to us by X bar plus, not, not plus or minus, uh, such a habit to write plus or minus, but with this, um, you, you, we're only going to write plus. This is going to be Z alpha now. So I'm going to find the, um, the percentile that puts, uh, you know, all of my alpha in one tail times sigma over root n. The lower uh, 1 minus alpha percent ci is going to be x bar minus z alpha sigma over root n. And if we had a t distribution, then substitute in s for sigma and put the t in place of z, and everything works out. All right. So I hope that helps with, with kind of understanding what's happening with these one-sided confidence intervals. So I've just uh, stated these formulas over here. Um, I gave an example in the course packet. Maybe, maybe it actually helps to go um, just identify this. So an example that will be familiar with everybody is a 95% confidence interval. So with a 95% confidence interval, 
my uh, z alpha by 2 in, in this picture right here. So um, my z alpha by 2 would be 1.96. So um, we can go draw it. It looks something like this. If I have 1.96 minus 1.96, I have 95% in the middle. And then that leaves 2.5% in either tail. If I want a one-sided 95% confidence interval, so one-sided, I'm going to use instead Z.95, or Z.05 if we follow my notation earlier, <clears throat> is 1.645. So let's just go um, draw a picture of this to make sure this is completely clear. So if this is a z distribution, and if I take the value 1.645, that point puts 95% to the left and 5% in the tail. So that's all there is to a uh, one-sided confidence interval, is instead of spreading your alpha across two tails, we put all of the alpha in one tail, and we just compute one side of the interval. So let's go do a problem. Let's say that there's an election coming up, and we just did a poll of 921 randomly selected, I shouldn't have said people, um, likely voters. And what we found from this poll is that 52.4% said they were going to vote for my candidate. Now, I can go compute the standard error. So here's our standard error. And I could give you a problem like this. Go find a two-sided 95% confidence interval for the, uh, you know, the, the, the true percentage who will vote for our candidate. So in that case, what I'm going to do is use a z-value of 1.96, like I drew in my pictures, and we would just take our, our proportion estimate plus or minus 1.96 times the standard error. So the standard error comes up here, and we end up with this interval with a lower and upper bound. Now, instead, I could also ask you something like this. Go find a two-sided 90% confidence interval. The only thing that would change is that I would use 1.645 instead of 1.96, and we'd get a slightly narrower uh, window where we thought the parameter lies. So 0.4969 up to 55.11. That's where we think the true percentage is. Notice with, not, uh, with both of these, I, I, I can't really rule out the possibility that we're behind. So if there's only two candidates, there's a chance that we're just under 50% and we would lose to the opposition. Not, not a very high chance, but um, there's a, it's, it's possible. Okay. Now, suppose that we only care about one side of this. So let's go find a one-sided 95% confidence interval. And all I care about is um, that we're not behind. So I'm going to go find the lower one-sided 95% confidence interval. So the only thing that differs here is I'm finding a 95% conf one-sided confidence interval. I'm going to use 1.645 just as I used when I was doing a two-sided 90% confidence interval. So the, here I'm splitting my alpha of 10% up into two tails. Here I'm putting all of my alpha in one tail. And so here is my interval. And notice 0.4969 is exactly the same bound that we had on the lower end with um, a two-sided 90% confidence interval. Now, if you wanted a one-sided 90% confidence interval, we'd have to use the z-value of 1.282, which would be the 90th percentile of a normal distribution. And so um, you'd get a different interval. If you're wondering where I got that number, 1.282, uh, let's just go over to R for a second. And if I do, let's do Q norm of 0.9, this gives us 1.282, Q norm 
uh, 0.95 should be 1.645. So you see where I'm getting those numbers. So that's, um, that's it for a one-sided confidence interval. Um, you should uh, now go practice on a few problems out of DeVore.